الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تبارك وتعالى ولوطا إذ قال لقومه أتأتون الفاحشة ما سبقكم بها من أحد من العالمين إنكم لتأتون الرجال شهوة من دون النساء بل أنتم قوم مسرفون وما كان جواب قومه إلا أن قالوا أخرجوهم من قريتكم إنهم أناس يتطهرون فأنجيناه وأهله إلا امرأته كانت من الغابرين وأمطرنا عليهم مطرا فانظر كيف كان عاقبة المجرمين صدق الله العظيم اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وصل على سيدنا مولانا محمد كلما غفر عن ذكره الغافلون اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد أفضل سلواتك Tonight inshallah we'll continue our tafsir from ayah number 80 of surah al-a'raf verse 80 chapter 7 and as I have mentioned previously that now we have entered this part of Surah Al-A'raf which only introduces us to the stories of previous prophets and their people. So far we have learned the story of Nuh and his people and by the way Nuh was sent to a nation and he preached in that nation for hundreds of years but that nation didn't have its own name it was always known as so it was all, always known as the people of Nuh the nation of Nuh they didn't have their own name. Unlike that, the story that came after the story of Nuh was the story of Hud His people were called Aad. So they had their own identity, they had their own name. So when Allah talks about the people of Hud He doesn't say Qawma Hud. In this place, in Surah Al-A'raf, he says, وَإِلَىٰ عَادٍ أَخَاهُمْ هُودًا To Aad, we sent their brother Hud. Likewise, the third story was the story of Salih and his people. And his people also had their own name and their own identity. And they were called Thamud. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِلَىٰ ثَمُودَ أَخَاهُمْ صَالِحًا so the name Thamud and Aad were the names of nations, names of the, the, the nations to which the prophets were sent. And Hud and Salih alayhim salam are the names of the prophets. Hud alayhim salam was sent to Aad and Salih alayhim salam was sent to Thamud. Now we come across, beginning from verse 80, ayah number 80 of Surah Al-A'raf, we come across the story of Lut alayhi salam. Like Nuh alayhi salam, Lut alayhi salam was also sent to a nation which had no name of its own. In the history of mankind, this nation has no self-identity. The only way we can identify these people is by saying the people of Lut alayhi salam. So whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the, the people of Lut alayhi salam, He mentions them by the reference of Lut alayhi salam. Qawman Lut, Qawman Lut. So here as well Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the story of Lut alayhi salam and his people by saying, وَلُوتًا إِذْ قَالَ لِقَوْمِهِ and remember, when Lut said to his people, Ata'tun al-fahisha, do you commit such 
act of immorality, such act of lewdness. مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ That no one in the history of mankind has ever done before you. And not just here, Lut alayhi salam said, مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ Nowhere in the universe has anyone done something like this before you. You're the first ones in the history of the universe basically. Because when you expand the word alameen, it includes everything that, that you can possibly think of. Not just humans, but any living beings that you can think of is included in the definition of alameen. So he basically said, you're the first ones in the universe who are committing this act of immorality, this act of lewdness, this act of sexuality that no one in the universe has ever done something like this before. So let's move aside from here inshallah and talk a little bit about Lut alayhi salam and his people. Lut alayhi salam is very closely related to the great, great Prophet of Allah, Ibrahim And in terms of time, both of these Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can say roughly, they came maybe 2500 years before Isa So 2500 BC, you may say. And they're definitely after Nuh السلام, after Aad, uh, the people of Aad, after Hud السلام, and after Salih Allah knows best what is the exact time difference between the passing away of Salih السلام, and the coming of Ibrahim السلام, but it is, it is sufficient to say that there is long period of time between the between the destruction of the people of Salih salam, Thamud, and the birth of Ibrahim salam. Ibrahim salam, we will talk about his story when, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of his story, and his story will not be mentioned in this surah. And this surah does not talk about Ibrahim salam. We have already talked about the different, and there are different stories of Ibrahim salam mentioned in the Quran. Not just one story. Because Ibrahim Islam's life is so comprehensive and such all-encompassing aspects of life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the story of it mentions different stories of Ibrahim Islam in different places throughout the Quran that are very relevant and very lesson bearing. Fruitful stories. So in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduced us to some stories of Ibrahim Islam, including the building of the Kaaba. And then again, in some other places, we learn the stories of Ibrahim Islam. And most recently, there was a story of Ibrahim Islam and his encounter with his people when he was still living in the nation in which he was born. Ibrahim Islam was born in Iraq. And the place that they say he was born in born in was Or. O-R-E. That's the place that Ibrahim Islam was born in. So now we're moving away from the story of Lut Islam, and that's why I will stop right there. So Lut salam is very closely related to Ibrahim salam, and that's a unanimous fact. Everybody agrees to that. There is no second opinion about that. How closely? That's a matter of uh, difference of opinion. Some say he was the cousin of uh, Ibrahim salam. So they say that he was the son of the brother of Ibrahim uh, He was the son of uncle of Ibrahim salam. So that way he's the cousin. And most historians believe that this is the correct opinion. That Lut was the cousin 
of Ibrahim a.s. Others say that he was not the cousin but the nephew of Ibrahim a.s. And then there's another opinion that he was also, he was cousin but not through uncle but he was the, Lut a.s. was the son of Ibrahim a.s. aunt, Ibrahim a.s. khala. And that's how they were related. These are the three opinions. And there's also this opinion that the wife of Ibrahim a.s. Sarah radiallahu anha, she was the brother, uh, she was the sister of Lut a.s. So there was another relationship. In that sense, Lut a.s. was also the brother-in-law of Ibrahim a.s. But the bottom line is Lut a.s. was very closely related to uh, Ibrahim a.s. And as a matter of fact, he was the first one to believe in the message of Ibrahim a.s. In Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in Surah Al-Ankabut where he said, فَآمَنَ لَهُ Lut. Lut believed in Ibrahim a.s. When Ibrahim a.s. said, I'm a prophet of Allah, Allah has chosen me, Allah has given me guidance, Allah has chosen me as his messenger, as his prophet. The very first person to believe in him was his cousin or his nephew Lut alayhi salam. His own father rejected him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that conversation in the Quran as well, in Surah Maryam, where Ibrahim alayhi salam gives da'wah to his own father. And the father rejected him. And not just rejected him, but banished his own son. The father said, Either you come back to the religion of your ancestors or you get out of here. So at that time, Ibrahim salam said, Inni muhadirun ila rabbi. I'm, I will leave you for the sake of Allah. If that's what you want, I will never return to the ways of my ancestors because my ancestors were not on the right path. You are not on the right path. You have been misguided. So I can never go back to those ways. But the second option that you have given me to leave you and to get out of here, I will embrace that and I will leave you. And there, therefore, after that incident, Ibrahim salam left his people, left his family, left his father. And there were only few people who migrated with Ibrahim salam. So here's the number of people who migrated with Ibrahim a.s. There were three other people who migrated with, with Ibrahim a.s. One was Lut a.s. The other one was the wife of Lut a.s. And the fourth person was the wife of Ibrahim a.s. Sarah radiallahu anha. These four people migrated uh, from Iraq and they went to the land of Palestine. And in old days, this whole land was called Bilad al-Sham. In some sense, it was called Sham. And in some, in some sense, it was called Bilad al-Sham. And Philistine or Yer uh, Jerusalem was part of it. And Ibrahim a.s. decided to, uh, to leave Iraq and come and settle over here with his family. So the place where Ibrahim salam came and settled was, uh, is known today as Hebron. Hebron is a Hebrew word. In, in Arabic, this city is called Al-Khalil. Ibrahim salam was Khalil. He was the friend of Allah. So Muslims call, always called it Al-Khalil. Even today, Muslims call this city Al-Khalil. And it is part of the West Bank today. So, in, uh, in, in Hebrew, this city is called Hebron. Uh, and if you look at the map, the city will be, will, will be under the name of Hebron. H-E-B-R-O-M. In, uh, in Hebrew, it's Hebron, but in English, it is pronounced as Hebron. This is a city where Ibrahim came with his family and settled. That's where Ishaq was born as well. <clears throat> and then uh, Ismail alayhi salam, according to some reports was born here as well 
but, uh, but that happened before the birth of Ishaq alayhi salam and at that time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Ibrahim alayhi salam to take his wife uh, Hajra radiallahu anha and his newly born son Ismail alayhi salam and take them to Makkah and, and, uh, and settle them over there. But Ibrahim alayhi salam came back here and he had his family here. This is where he lived and this is where he died. His grave is here in Hebron in Al Khalid. Alhamdulillah, I had the honor of visiting the grave of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. So there is a compound. Uh, over that compound, there's a cave. So the graves are in a deep cave. Some say it's 16 meters deep into the ground. Some say it's 16 feet into the ground. But there is a cave which has the graves of Ibrahim alayhi salam and his family. And this uh, this, this, this small cemetery, the family cemetery is called Maqbaratul Khalil. The, fam, the, the, the cemetery of Khalil and his family. So there Ibrahim salam is buried there. Uh, his son Ishaq salam is buried there. His wife Sarah radiallahu anha is buried there. And the wife of Ishaq salam, Rifqa is buried there. And also Yaqub salam is buried there. And according to some reports, one of the wives of Yaqub is also buried there. I personally went to the graves of, uh, not to the graves, but above the graves there are markers. So there is a marker of Ibrahim Islam's grave. There is a marker of Sarah radiallahu anha's grave. There is a marker of uh, Ishaq Islam's grave. And there is also the marker of his wife Rifqa radiallahu anha's grave. Now above, above this cave, they, there is a masjid. And that masjid was initially uh, constructed by Salahuddin Ayyubi. Salahuddin Ayyubi, when he conquered Jerusalem 700 years ago, he decided to uh, build a masjid above this cemetery, above these graves. And that masjid is still standing. Uh, that masjid is still there. Is, uh, some call that Masjid al Khalil, and some, uh, some just call it, uh, still call it Maqbarat al Khalil. So that masjid is actually above that ground where the graves of uh, Ibrahim salam and his family are there. Lut salam, where did he go? So what, what happened, if you, if you know the map of Middle East, you will understand what I'm about to say. The way from Iraq to Palestine is coming in a way that Jerusalem uh, Jerusalem comes first and then after Jerusalem if you are going toward Jordan Jordan is further north Iraq is south of Jordan or and even south of uh, Jerusalem and Jordan or Amman is north of Jerusalem so Ibrahim salam came and settled here in this part of the Philistine which is now called al Hebron or uh, Al Khalil. Lut salam initially came here and settled here. He lived here for some time. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had another mission for Lut salam as the Prophet, as the Messenger. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to leave this place and go to uh, some nearby cities. And those cities were called Sadun and Gamura. In English, they are known as Sodom and Gomorrah. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Lut alayhi salam to take his family, his wife, and his children. And according to many reports, he had two daughters. He didn't, he didn't have any son. He had two daughters. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to uh, migrate along with his family to this place called Sadum and Gamura or Sarum and, and Gomorrah. According to some his, his, historical reports, there were not two towns, but four towns. But they were all part of the same, same city. And this place happened to be about 25 or 20, 25 to 27 miles from where Ibrahim al Islam was. So the distance between these towns to where Lut al Islam uh, going to settle and where Ibrahim al-Islam had already settled was not too much. It was, it was maybe 
uh, two day, uh, one day and one night's uh, travel according to that time when you just when you would just uh, go on foot or you would just go on a camel or on a horse or donkey and in modern in modern times the distance since it is only 25 to 27 miles so you can easily uh, go from Hebron to this place uh, in about an hour so the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Lut salam to these people because these people were really really wicked people and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to give them a final chance so they could be saved Allah doesn't like to punish people Allah doesn't like to destroy people Allah doesn't like to wipe humans off the surface of this earth this earth is for humans that's why Allah sent us here but when people become so evil so bad so wicked then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them chances that this is your first warning this is your first chance to repent and become better become good people so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Lut salam to remind these people, teach them that what you are doing is really, really bad, is really, really wrong. And you need to repent to Allah and you need to correct yourselves, amend your ways of life. So according to some reports, Lut salam preached to these people for 30 years. Now, the most important evil or the most prominent evil that these people used to commit is the evil of homosexuality. These people were the first ones who introduced homosexuality to the humanity. So this is the most important evil or the most prominent evil that these people committed and these people introduced to the world. But they were involved in other evils and in other uh, wicked ways of life as well. They used to steal money from people. They used to rob the travelers. This was an important route between Damascus and Yemen. So people going from Damascus to Yemen would go through this, this part of the land. Even today the road actually goes through this, this part of the land. So they were on, on a very very significant junction on, on route from Damascus to Yemen, from north to south. So they used to rob the caravans, they used to rob the travelers, and they used to hurt people. So there's one story that, uh, that's, uh, that Abdul Wahab Najjar has mentioned, one of, the, one of the narrators and historians. He said, once, so Ibrahim al Islam from time to time, he used to come from Jerusalem, he used to come from Hebron and check on his family. This was also his family, check on his cousin or his nephew and find out what they're doing. And he used to give da'wah sometimes as well to these people as well. So once it, it is reported that Ibrahim al-Islam himself couldn't go, but he sent someone, a friend of his or someone who, who used to uh, who, uh, who was very friendly with Ibrahim salam. So Ibrahim salam sent that person to check on Lut salam and his family. So when this person entered the city, the people of Lut salam, being, they were, being that they were wicked, they were really bad, they thought they should try to harm this stranger. So there was one person who threw a rock or through a stone more likely uh, and the stone hit the head of uh, this friend of Ibrahim salam, and he started bleeding the, uh, the blood you know came out of, uh, came out of the wound and it basically turned his head red so this person comes to uh, this friend of Ibrahim salam, and he says listen I have painted your head red now you owe me money you have to give me money for painting your head red and this friend of Ibrahim Islam, he's astonished he's like you're the one who hurt me you're the one who wounded me you should be the one compensating me for this pain and for this injury and 
You are the one asking me to pay you? So this person, he says, no, no, you are in our city, you'll have to live by our laws. And our law is that you have to pay me. So he takes him to their so-called court. And the judge, he issues the decree in favor of this claimant. He says, no, no, this is true. Since he gave you red color on your head, you have to pay him. So Abdul Wahab Najjar mentioned that the cousin, of, or the friend of Ibrahim al Islam, he became so upset at this situation and what was happening and how crazy these people were. In order to teach them a lesson, he picked up a rock, he picked up a stone, and he, he hit that stone uh, uh, to the head of uh, this judge. And the judge started bleeding. So now he said, listen, now you owe me money because I painted your head. So the money that you owe me, you can give it to him. <laughs> and then he ran away. Because he, he, he was the only one, he was alone. And if he stayed there any longer, they would have arrested him and killed him. So he ran away from there and went back to Ibrahim Islam and reported him. So Lut salam, he continued to give da'wah to these people for, uh, according to one report, as I said, for 30 years. But then every time he used to teach them, they would just criticize him and they would just uh, make fool out of him. So every time he used to say, you're doing this, you're doing that, they would, they would say, why don't you leave our city? Why don't you get out of here? You, you're so, you're pretending to be so pure. You're pretending to be so clean. You're pretending to be so pious. You don't belong here. Get out of here. So Lut salam sincerely would remind them that if you continue to do this, what you're doing, then Allah will punish you. Allah's adab will come. So one day they said to him, uh, that when they became frustrated with the da'wah, with the reminders, with the warnings of Lut salam they said to him, Bring us the adab of Allah if you are really truthful, if you are telling the truth. Bring us what you what you have always been telling us that oh adab of Allah will come, adab of Allah will come. So bring us that adab. So at that time, when it, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that now the the, the excuse has been lifted and these people have been given every possible reason to uh, turn away from their evil doings and they did not so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that now it's time for these people to be removed from the surface of this earth these people must be destroyed now so Allah sent angels there was a group of angels who came down to deliver the message uh, to Lut and what was the message to Lut the message to Lut was that he, Allah has already decided that he's going to punish these people he's going to destroy them all of them so you should leave from this city uh, on that night when angels came they said when the night falls you should prepare take your family and leave the city and go as far as you can and no one should turn back no one should even look back because anyone who will look back he may he may, may become the victim as well so before they came to Lut salam to deliver the message for which they they were coming down they also went to visit Ibrahim salam so when the angels went to visit Ibrahim salam Ibrahim salam quickly went out and he uh, he uh, he slaughtered uh, a sheep and uh, he roasted the, the meat and he brought the meat as as a hospitality. Ibrahim salam is known in the history of mankind for his hospitality, for his generosity. He he showed his genero generosity not only to those who were his friends but even to his enemies. So Ibrahim salam, when he saw that these, when these guests came to his house and these angels, they came in form of humans. They did not come in form of angels. So Ibrahim salam, didn't 
realize that these are not humans. He thought these are humans and humans eat. So Ibrahim Islam quickly went out and he quickly slaughtered a goat or sheep and he roasted the meat and he quickly brought the food. And when he brought the food and he presented it to the angels so they could have the dinner uh, as they were strangers and they were travelers, the angels are not eating. So when Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, notices that these people are not showing any interest in the food, he became a little scared because if someone is hungry and not eating, there, there is a possibility. And in those times, that's how it was received. It was, a, it was an alarm for Ibrahim alayhi salam that maybe these are not guests, these are robbers. So they have come to his house to either hurt them or to rob them. So that's why Ibrahim alayhi salam became scared. So when the angels realized that Ibrahim alayhi salam is getting scared and becoming uncomfortable with their presence, so they opened up and they said, لا تخف. Do not, do not uh, be afraid. We are the messengers of Allah. We are the angels. And Allah has sent us to you to give you the good news of a child. You will soon have a baby. And this, this good news was being given to Ibrahim alayhi salam and Sarah radiallahu anha. So Sarah radiallahu anha was standing on the side. And the moment she heard angels saying that Ibrahim, you, you soon will have a baby in your house. Fadahika. So she, she started laughing. She, she thought it's ridiculous because uh, Sarah was over 90 years old at that time and Ibrahim was over 100 years old at that time. So she said, uh, really, I'm going to give birth? Look at me, I'm so old. And look at my husband. He's so old. He's older than me. Where are we going to get the baby from? So the angel said to Sarah, Oh, mother of the believers, do you wonder, do you, do you really... Uh, doubt the the mercy of Allah? Does that surprise you that Allah will show you mercy in this age? May Allah's blessing and mercy be upon you, all the blessed family. Allah is the one who is all praiseworthy and Allah is the one who is all glory, glorified. So when Ibrahim al Islam became comfortable with these angels and started having conversations, that's when angels told Ibrahim al Islam, our real mission is to go to those towns of Sadum and Gamura, Sodom and Gomorrah, and destroy all of them. They didn't mention Lut al Islam. So all of a sudden, Ibrahim al Islam, he started arguing with angels. Yujadiluna. He started arguing with the angels saying, How can you destroy this town when Lut is there? Alayhi salam. And he's a pious servant of Allah. He's a messenger of Allah. How can you destroy this town? So they said, We know very well who's in that town. And we know Lut is there. His family is there. And then they said, We will save Lut and his family. But we're going to destroy everybody else. And that's exactly what they did. So after Ibrahim al Islam, Ibrahim al Islam argued with them for many reasons. First of all, he was worried for his family, for Lut al Islam and his family. And then he was also trying to get some more, uh, some more time, borrow some more time. So maybe these people will repent to Allah and they will be saved from the adab of Allah. But the angel said, that has already been destined, that has already been decided there will be no change in the decision of Allah. Allah has already decided that these people will be destroyed tonight. So then these angels come to Lut salam, and when they come to Lut salam, they also come in form of humans and they appear at the door of uh, Lut salam, as strangers and as really handsome men. 
And that was a test for the people, the final test for the people of Lut alayhi salam. So as soon as they entered, Lut alayhi salam quickly opened the door to welcome them because they were strangers. They didn't explain they were angels. If Lut alayhi salam wanted to do uh, the yafa for them, he wanted to host them. So he welcomed them in and then quickly he got scared. He got scared for the honor of these people. Because he knew that his nation, his people were so filled in their lust that they, as soon as they would find out that there are some handsome men in, his, in the house of Lut they would come in form of a mob and they would attack the house of Lut and they would grab these men to fulfill their, their, their wrongful desires. So Lut became scared for that reason. So, uh, and, that, and exactly what happened, uh, somehow the people of Lut al-Islam got alerted that there are some new people in the house of Lut al-Islam and those people came swarming to the house of Lut al-Islam and they started demanding Lut al-Islam to hand over these people to them. Lut al-Islam said, no, no, I cannot do that. These are my guests. How can, I, how, can, how can I hand them over to you? But they insisted. They said, you, you do that or we will attack you, we will harm you, we will do this, this and that. At that time, these angels jumped in and they said to Lut a.s. Don't, don't worry about us. We are angels. Allah has sent us to destroy this, this town, these nations and you have to leave by tonight from this city. You take your family and go away from here and no one should even look back what's happening. Because you will, basically the message was you will hear screams, you will hear people dying, you will hear people being destroyed, being wiped off, off the surface of this earth. So there will be a lot of noise, a lot of panic, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of screams, but don't look back. They're not allowed to look back. Nobody's allowed to look back. You keep moving. Keep moving. Go away as far away as you can. And when Lut left from that city with his family, there was one person from his family who was left behind. And that was the wife of Lut She, Allah mentions in all places throughout the Quran, that she was the one except his wife she was the one who, who left behind who did not go with Lut according to some reports she did leave initially with Lut because she knew that the, the punishment was coming but then she started looking back and she started basically uh, you know uh, feeling sympathetic to these people uh, in the sense that they should not have been destroyed so uh, when she looked back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's adab caught her as well and destroyed her as well. But according to most reports, she did not leave. Uh, she stayed there. She refused. She said, you can go. You take your daughters. I'm not leaving. I'm staying with these people. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to stay here. And this was not the wife that uh, Lut alayhi salam had married in Iraq who had migrated with him. The, according to some reports, this was a woman uh, that Lut had married from these people, from this nation, either from Sadum or Ghamura or from these nations. So uh, when Lut went uh, you know, away from this city at a comfortable, uh, at a, you know, comfortable distance, that's when the adab of Allah uh, began to appear. And this happened in the later part of the night. It didn't happen in the early part. The early part of the night was the time when Lut left from his nation. Later part of the night, maybe when we performed Salat al-Tahajjud, that was a time when Adab came upon these people. So there were different. There was a variety, uh, uh, you know, of different forms of Adab. Uh, it began, according to some reports, with a with a very very loud scream. So uh, that really panicked them and caused them a lot of grief and a lot of pain, anxiety, and they began to 
die from inside, from within, and then other forms of adab of Allah begin to appear, the most prominent form of adab that is mentioned in the Quran is وَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ مَطَعَ A rain from, from uh, above came down upon them. But this was not the rain of water. This was a rain of stones. حِجَارَةً مِنْ سِجِّيلٍ they were, uh, they were baked clay stones. And those stones were like missiles. So, and it was a rain. It was, you could not escape it. Even if you were under some shelter, the stones would come down and would kill these people. So that was the most prominent form of adab. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, فَجَعَلْنَا عَالِيَهَا سَاكِلَهَا After all these people died and the adab came, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want that same surface of the land to stay the way it was with the sins of these people. So Allah turned the, that portion of the land upside down. So if they were living here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the angels to turn the surface, the ground upside down. So the bottom of the land came up and the top of the land went on the bottom. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want that same ground stay on top and the place where it happened some say it is exactly the same spot where today we have the Dead Sea that's where these people lived there were as I mentioned there were four either four towns or two towns most famously we know that there were two towns Sadum and Ghamura Sodom and Gomorrah that's why this the sin of homosexuality is also referred to as sodomy. In Bible, it is, it is referred to as sodomy because these people were known as sodomites. The, the residents, the inhabitants of this town were, were called uh, sodomites. Uh, so, this sin is also sometimes referred to as sodomy. In Bible, it is referred to as sodomy. So, according to uh, some reports, the, the location of these cities is the exact location where the Dead Sea is today. And according to others, uh, it is, you know, obviously the Dead Sea, that's where these people lived, but many of them lived on the outskirts of the Dead Sea as well. That's why in some recent uh, archaeological excavations, uh, they have discovered some homes on the borderline of the Dead Sea that really take them back to the time when these people lived, the people of Lut So that means that their population may have extended to even the outskirts of the Dead Sea, but when the Adab of Allah came, they were all within that area of the Dead Sea, and when when the bottom went, when the top went on the bottom, according to some reports, it went so deep uh, that uh, it naturally water took place on, uh, you know, on, on the surface of that ground. And it, it is today the lowest point on earth, below sea level. According to some reports, it is 418 meters below sea level. So it is, it is a known fact, it is a scientific fact that this point on earth is the lowest point below the sea level. So Allah knows best what happened. Uh, I, was, uh, I was, you know, passing by that same edge of the Dead Sea. We drove by that same edge of the Dead Sea uh, this year when I went to Jerusalem. Uh, and it really shook me at that time that you know when when that adab of Allah came this whole place was probably scared to death not just not just people who all died anyways but even the mountains surrounding that ground witnessed that adab of Allah this adab of Allah was unlike any adab that Allah had sent before or after this was a very very severe form 
of adab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And since it is, uh, it is uh, apparently the place where the adab of Allah came, so we should not make that into a tourism spot. We should not be touring there as, you know, entertainment and all that. Many people, uh, kuffar mostly, they go there for their vacations because the Dead Sea water is the water that harbors no life. That does not allow any form of life to exist. The content of salt in that water is so high that it does not allow any life to exist. So there's no, there's no fish, there's no sea life, there's nothing, nothing at all. Yeah. Now, when I, when I went to Amman, at the airport we saw uh, some, you know, uh, cosmetics. And they were called Dead Sea Cosmetics. So some cosmetic companies are producing, you know, uh, cosmetics for women, makeup stuff for women from the water, using the water of the Dead Sea or using the mineral of the Dead Sea. And I would advise, you know, my sisters, uh, you know, that they should avoid if they, it's some, you know, some women have begun to really like those uh, products because they, they feel good or something like there's something in it, uh, I would advise against that. I would say, you know, if you, if you have heard about it uh, and you're, you're really thinking about getting that, you should not because it is very, very likely that it is coming from the same ground where the adab of Allah came. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. I, I couldn't, uh, I would have taken you to that place on Google Maps today, but uh, something was missing, uh, you know, that connects my laptop to uh, the projector. But next week, inshallah, I'll show you, you'll have a better idea of, you know, what we have talked about. So, is there any organized religion which, uh, which may not promote, may not be the right word, but like favors homosexuality? No, there is none. And, and this, is, this is a very astonishing fact uh, uh, that, uh, you know, Catholic Church is the largest branch of Christianity, largest denomination of Christianity. And it's, it's the verses regarding uh, sodomy and homosexuality are very clear in Bible and in Jewish text as well. Because these religions came after uh, Lut uh, the Torah came after Lut alayhi salam, Injil came after Lut alayhi salam, Gospel, uh, all these, they all came after Lut alayhi salam, and they all make mention of the story of Lut alayhi salam and his people. There are a lot of inaccuracies and even blasphemous things regarding the stories of uh, Lut alayhi salam uh, and some other prophets. But the, the point is that these things are mentioned in there and the historic ground of you know Christianity, Judaism, Islam had always been that homosexuality is a sin and it should not be allowed. And that was the case uh, you know not uh, until not too long ago when uh, those who are in favor of legalizing same-sex marriage, uh, you know, we're not really uh, pouring so much money into their campaigns, into their marketing, that they really brainwashed everybody. If you just go back 10 years or 20 years, you would find a different mentality and different view of people of homosexuality. And today, because there's so much, you know, uh, marketing, so much uh, advocacy, uh, regarding the legalization of you know same-sex marriage and homosexuality and all of that that it has totally changed the view of people the 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 media has successfully changed the view of people but they you know uh, they they know uh, as a matter of fact that you know the biblical tax the Jewish tax and the Islamic tax obviously they're very clear in, in, in these things being uh, immoral, uh, being, Ill, uh, 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 being unethical.